Hi friends, you are back with me, Professor Girish Kukreja. If you remember in our earlier lecture, we were talking about uh, this feedback inhibition, right? Probably looking at those so many pathways, you might think like what is going to happen and nothing is going to happen, don't worry. <laughs> so talking about uh, this feedback inhibition, if you remember, I had told that when it comes to a branched pathway, one way to control uh, uh, what you call as the excess uh, working of this particular pathway when the end products are in excess is to control at the branch point. So if you can see here, like here I have shown a typical branched pathways and you can see the end products like you have your P1, it is exercising a control on its branch point. Let me uh, label these particular enzymes, say for example, we have uh, this particular enzyme as your E3 and this particular enzyme as your E4. So the pressure or not, not pressure, <laughs> the control which is being exerted by these particular end products is on their specific enzymes. So P1 is exerting its effect on E3, P2 is exerting its effect on E4. So in each of the cases, you will find that they are exerting the control on their branch points, right? Probably you will not understand this video if you have not seen the earlier one. <laughs> so anyways, uh, go back and switch to the first section of this particular video. So, but uh, to summarize, the problem is that say I am having a particular branched pathway where I start with a precursor say A. A goes for synthesizing B. B is letting converted into C. From C there are branches. So from C you synthesize D. From D you synthesize E. From E you get one end product of this particular pathway that is P1. Say let may be an amino acid, lay for example, because most of the times you will find that these kinds of feedback inhibition loops, they are found in the synthesis of your amino acid. So you have say one particular P1 being synthesized, you have this C again getting diverted to F via G to your another particular product that is P2, right? The problem was that if I want to turn off this particular pathway, the problem was that if I want to turn off this particular pathway, I have to like switch over this and I told that if P1 is in excess and if I turn off this particular part, it will hamper the synthesis of P2. If P2 is in excess and I turn off this particular part, it will hamper the synthesis of P1. So the control point which I want is that the pathway should be halted when P1 and P2 both are in excess and the pathway should continue when either of the one is in less amount than it was decided by the cell which we call as the threshold. If P1 and P2 both are above their threshold values, I want to stop this particular pathway. This is the crux. For this, the cell, it utilizes different strategies. So today we'll be talking about the different strategies to control the synthesis of this C, rather to stop the synthesis of this C when we have an excess amount of both P1 as well as P2. One of the ways the cell does this is by this particular mechanism which we call as the concerted feedback inhibition, also referred to as the nested feedback inhibition. In concerted feedback inhibition, this particular first enzyme of the pathway which we call as the E1, it won't be affected by excess of your P1 alone. It also won't be affected by the excess of your P2 alone. Now say for example, if A is getting converted to B, B is getting converted to C, from C there is a branch point, P1 is being synthesized, P2 is being synthesized, right? Now I have an excess of P1, this P1 will go and inhibit E3, at the same time this E1 will have a site where this P1 can bind, binding of your P1 on this particular enzyme, E1 does not affect the enzyme at all, right? If the reverse thing happens, say for example, in another particular situation, say P2 is in excess and this P2 goes and binds E1. E1 has site for binding both, right? So if P2 goes and binds E1 alone in the absence of P1, the what you call as activity of E1 won't be affected, right? But now say for example, I have a situation where both are in excess. Now I have P1 as well as P2 both in excess. Now when these both are in excess, they go and now bind to this particular E1, the activity of this enzyme will be halted. This is what I exactly wanted. I wanted this particular enzyme to get halted when I have excess amounts of both P1 as well as P2. But I'll say that this is a bit imprecise kind of a control. Because what happens is, if I have P1 is in, in excess, this particular pathway is not affected at all. Probably if it would have reduced to a particular extent, that would be a more fine-tuned metabolic control. 
But here, synthesis of any one in excess does not affect this particular pathway at all. If both are in excess, I have P1 in excess, I have P2 in excess, they both go and have this particular control on this particular enzyme and they stop this particular enzyme. You'll find this kind of control in uh, synthesis of threonine and lysine by bacillus polymyxa, right? Uh, so bacillus polymyxa, when it is synthesizing threonine and lysine, when both the amino acids, they are in excess, they will go and inhibit the first enzyme of this particular pathway, right? So this is your concerted feedback inhibition. At least you achieve that when both the products are in excess, this particular pathway will be halted. When any one of these now is lowered, like you consume one of them, like if the cell consumes P1 or cell is devoid of this P2, then this inhibition will be relieved and the pathway will again go in that fashion. Right. So this is what is called as your concerted feedback inhibition. A more uh, what you call as um, fine-tuned metabolic kind of a control which you can see is observed in this particular feedback inhibition which we call as the cumulative feedback inhibition. In this cumulative feedback inhibition, now as I told you I have uh, binding sites for both. This E1, it has binding sites for both. It has binding sites for P1, it also has this binding site for P2. Now but in this case what is going to happen? P1 if it goes and binds to this particular enzyme E1, it will inhibit the enzyme in one particular percentage. Say for example, 40% of the activity will be reduced. So what will happen is, you are going from A to B to C, you are going to P1, you are also going to P2. Now I have a situation where P1 is in excess, P1 goes and stops the uh, what you call as action of E3, P1 also goes and inhibits E1 to some extent. So that, now you have this particular pathway operating at a lesser rate because now C is to be directed only to P2 and not towards the P1. So all your C would be directed to P2. Now you will achieve a point where P2 would be also in excess. It will also be synthesized more than the threshold value. So this P2, it will also go and inhibit this particular enzyme. Say it also inhibits say around 40-50% uh, say for example. Now when both are present on the surface of this particular enzyme E1, you will find the effect is somewhat additive of both these products. Now your enzyme would be around 80-90% totally inhibited in the presence of both the end products, your P1 and P2. You can find this like in regulation of glutamine synthetase. When both the end products are in excess, they go and inhibit the enzyme to a greater extent. When any one of the products is in excess, there is some percentage kind of a, what you call as decrease in the efficiency of the working of this particular enzyme. So I'll say that this is more fine-tuned control of the metabolism. Because if I have one in excess, I reduce it to a particular extent. If I have this one as extent, I reduce this in a particular extent. But if I have both of them in excess, I completely stop this particular pathway. This is what I actually wanted while controlling this particular kind of uh, uh, what you call as a branched pathway. Another way which this can be done, a more uh, what you call as a simplified way you can say is what is called as a sequential feedback inhibition. Now, simple logic what it says is, if A is getting converted to B, B is getting converted to C, C is being directed to P1 and C is also being directed to P2. So once I have P1 in excess, this excess of P1, it will go and inhibit E3, right? Excess of P2, it will go and inhibit E4, right? The ultimate result would be that A would be converted to B, B would be converted to C. And now C is not being cut to P1. Also, C is not being converted to your P2 because both of them, they are in excess. Now, when both of them, they are in excess, obviously, if this pathway continues, I will have a build-up in the concentration of the C. C will go on increasing, right? Why it will go on increasing? Because this is also halted, this is also halted, and this is still continuing. So, inside the cell, the concentration of C, it will go on increasing. Now, once the concentration of C, it goes on increasing, you will find that this C, it would go and inhibit the first enzyme, that is your E1, right? So, your first enzyme, that is your E1, is not under the control of your P1, neither it is under the control of P2, it is under the control of your C. So, excess of C now, right? 
excess of C, it controls and stops this particular enzyme E1. This is called as a sequential feedback inhibition, where you will find P1 is controlling E3, P2 is controlling E4 and C is controlling E1. So it works in a sequential manner. This you will find in the synthesis of aromatic amino acid like your tyrosine, tryptophan, phenylalanine when they are being synthesized, they show exert this kind of sequential feedback inhibition. Another particular mechanism is the use of isofunctional enzymes or use of what is called as your isozymes. Right, so isofunctional enzyme or isoenzymes, like we know, are the enzymes which are catalyzing the similar reaction, which have different properties. Now, here for conversion of A to B, in this particular case, you will have two enzymes, two isoenzymes forms. You can see now you will have two enzymes, like I have one particular enzyme, say E1, and I'll have another particular enzyme, say E1 prime. Now, there are two enzymes which are actually converting my A into B. So, when P1 will be in excess. As it always does, it will go and inhibit E3. This P1, it will go and inhibit one of the isoenzymes of this. Say in this case, it inhibits E1. So P1 in excess will stop E3. It will also stop E1. Now A was converted to B by both of these isoenzyme forms. So even if P1 goes and stops E1, it is E1 prime, which is actually still converting your A into B, probably now at a lesser rate. Right. So now at a lesser rate, right, your A is being converted to B and B is being converted to C and this is being directed to P2. Now P2 would be in excess. Now once you have an excess amount of P2, this will go and inhibit E4 and P2, it exerts its control over E1. P2, it exerts its control over E1 prime. Now P2, it will go and inhibit this E1 prime and now this entire pathway would be halted. Right, how it would be halted because you have both of these particular isoenzyme forms which are inhibited. So you have two particular enzyme forms, right? You have E1 and you have E1 prime and both of them they are being inhibited. Any one particular enzyme in excess, it will inhibit one of them, right? This particular product, it will inhibit one of it. And ultimately when both are in excess, this entire conversion will be halted, right? This also you will find in synthesis of your uh, methionine in uh, lysine uh, uh, from uh, what you call as your aspartate, right? So this particular isoenzyme or isofunctional enzyme you will find in uh, such particular mechanisms. So these are four basic ways in which a particular feedback inhibition it could be exerted. To just summarize, in a concerted feedback inhibition, both the end products, individual product will not have any effect. When both are in excess, they will go and stop the enzyme. In cumulative feedback inhibition, each end product will have some effect, but when both are bound, the total effect would be more. In the sequential feedback inhibition, these products, they do not exert any control on the first path of this particular pathway, but the branch point, this metabolite, it exerts its effect on the first enzyme. And in isoenzymes, we have two isoenzyme forms where two end products, they show their effect on these different isoenzyme form controlling the metabolism. Sometimes uh, I get mesmerized that right? how cell can, what you call as regulate a metabolism in such a complicated way, right? So cells are really uh, very intelligent in regulating the metabolism and controlling the biosynthetic pathway so that the energy is not wasted and it is utilized in a proper manner. Let us also learn from these particular cells and also utilize our energy in a proper manner and whatever is in excess, let us stop that. And whatever has gone below threshold, let us start synthesizing that. So thank you so much. Stay tuned with me. Professor Girish Kukreja for more in enzymology and microbiology.